Welcome to the GreenPill.network podcast. If you're just joining us, we are building a coordination, a network society of thousands of hackers, dreamers, and doers focused on using crypto to bring positive some digital systems to the world. This podcast features the people who are doing it, and we publish a season of five to 10 episodes every couple months. This season is about lean, mean capital allocation machines. Capital allocation is the process of deciding how to spend or invest financial resources to maximize returns. And with Web3, we can now maximize not just financial returns, but achieve Achieve impact equals profit, ecosystem growth, public goods funding, protopia. We can achieve all the things with incentives and capital allocation. How can we build crypto economic systems that precisely allocate capital allocation at scale? And what are the coolest experiments? These are the themes of Green Pill Season 4, Lean Mean Capital Allocation Machines. One special thing we are doing this season is allowing you to collect this episode. All episodes this season are available on chain. You can go to pods.media slash green pill and start collecting. Shout out to our top collectors, jtnickel.eth, hal.eth, simonsd.eth, 0xlucas.eth, skydow.eth, seanwbren.eth, and MMA on chain.eth as well as james.eth. Thanks for supporting the greenpill.network podcast. If you want to learn more about Greenpill, you can visit our website at greenpill.network where you can download the Greenpill book for free and become a member of your local greenpill.network chapter. All right. Well, our guest today is Brian Flynn. He's the CEO of Boost Studios and a part of the core team at Boost XYZ. He is the founder and CEO at Rabbit Hole, which is a contributor to Quest Protocol, and an early hire at OpenSea and Dapper Labs. Brian has been an innovator in the space for quite a while. And we are on this Green Pill episode going to be talking about using crypto to solve large-scale global coordination while also increasing global ca- economic opportunity. So I'm excited about Boost because I think it fits really squarely into our theme of capital allocation this this season. Boost is basically building a distributed incentive network. It allows anyone to deploy on-chain incentive offers to do on-chain actions and help their ecosystem grow. So basically think of Boost as a primitive that allows you to add an economic reward to any on-chain action or on-chain state within a certain amount of conditions. So if I wanted to reward people for contributing to Gitcoin grants, I could go to Boost and I could put some money into a contract and I could say, everyone, a contract that emits this event at, under these circumstances in these conditions can get a boost, can get a crypto economic reward for doing that. So um, I, I think that it's a really interesting example for me of scalable and precise capital allocation that doesn't use intermediaries. And that's what capital allocation season is is all about on Green Pill. So I think you're going to really enjoy this episode with Brian Flynn. All right. Hey, Brian, what's up? Hey, how's it going? It's going good. Happy Blob Day. As uh, Before we were recording, Happy you were Blob telling day. me that Coon is, is Blob Day. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. It's, it's fun to be in an ecosystem that's innovating so much, and there's just always so much to learn. And uh, having cheap L2s is going to open up a whole new design space. So, oh, yeah. Yeah. Happy Blob yeah, Day totally. to the audience as well. Yeah. I had to wear my uh, my green outfit, the Green Pill podcast today. As well as to get my green hat, my green okay. shirt. Nice. Well, uh, we will take our green pills for sure. Um, I, I'd love to kick off by just asking you an incredibly broad question. What is Rabbit Hole? What is Boost? And uh, what are you all focused on? Yeah, for sure. So Boost is, is the protocol behind Rabbit Hole, and it's a distributed incentives network. So anyone can issue tokens, commission an on-chain action for it to be completed by any address. So you can think of it as sort of an on-chain cake worker uh, protocol in, in some cases. Uh, so Rabbit Hole, most people know uh, that was sort of the first application that we built just for people to earn crypto by doing things on chain. Uh, Boost is kind of the evolution of Rabbit Hole and now the protocol uh, that powers Rabbit Hole and many other clients as well. Yeah. So you started it off with the market opportunity and you sort of innovated and iterated on a protocol from there. It sounds familiar to me. Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The, the good old journey of starting off as an application and then transitioning to a protocol, which you know well. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would you describe as the core mechanism behind Boost Protocol? Um, I, I think I saw a Twitter thread about direct to contract incentives. It, it, would you say that's, that's right. the core mechanism behind Boost? Yeah, the easiest way to think about it is an incentivization protocol, right? So you can basically specify any on-chain action, whether it's a mint or swap or land or a stake, any any action that can be defined on-chain, select the parameters from that 
on-chain action as well. Um, deposit tokens in a smart contract, specify an allow list of what you want to target on-chain based off some on-chain behavior, um, and then deploy the boost itself. I think directed contract is something that we've been exploring with a bunch of different grant programs. Obviously, once you have projects in the mix or getting grant programs, are kind of self-interested. And so when you're operating at a network level, sort of level behind, above the projects, the, the interesting question is, well, how do you benefit the project? So how do you benefit the network without the projects kind of being self-interested? Um, and so that's something we've been talking to some L2s about and in, in trying to kind of uh, go forward with this. So it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a journey, but it's been interesting seeing different actors in these DAO ecosystems sort of operate and how they use Boost as a mechanism to uh, incentivize and coordinate. Yeah, it feels like it's a very small primitive that enables a lot of interesting behaviors. So as I understand it, it's just sort of like a hook uh, or like a smart contract where you can you can point it at other smart contracts and you can say, hey, if this event is admitted or if it's in this certain state under these conditions, then issue a reward. Is that like too reductionist of an encapsulation of, of what Boost can do? No, that, that, that's exactly it. And I think what the most important part about it is that it's, it's a two-sided marketplace, right? So you have you have mm. issuers who are issuing incentives, and you also have like front-end clients who are also like displaying these boosts to users as well, right? And the front-end clients yeah. receive a cut of the boost rewards if they actually fulfill the boost on behalf of the users, right? So that actually incentivizes front-ends like Rabbit Hole and Wallets and other third-party influencers and creators as well to kind of share those boosts to your audience and they kind of cut it over. So you kind of look at it as sort of this new age on-chain advertising model. Yeah, it's really interesting because, I, I mean, as I was telling you before we were recording, this season is all about capital allocation and the hypothesis is that we'll be able to more precisely allocate capital at scale on chain than we ever could in the pre on chain internet. And and what I'm imagining Boost is is like it's it's this very simple but powerful primitive that allows you to program incentive fields and and add a boost literally to any on chain action. And I think there's a lot of opportunity to um, change the way capital is allocated in, in on top of that on top of that small primitive. And then the one thing I'll just add to that before I volley it back to you is that the last season we did of Green Pill was all about impact equals profit. Uh, so basically mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who are uh, trying to figure out how do we incentivize public goods funding in our ecosystems. And uh, through my work with Carl Cravone, I know that Carl's kind of doing analysis of, okay, this grantee got this much money and they created this much L2 block space consumption on optimism and they did X, Y, and Z education wise. And so something like Boost feels like it comes at it from the exact opposite angle of just providing a bottoms up primitive where people can self-assemble uh, around the impact that they want to see and add profit incentives. And maybe there's some version of the world in which these two things meet in the, meet in the, in the middle yeah. in the future. But uh, yeah, it's interesting that we're all sort of working on the same problem, but from different angles. Yeah, for, for sure. And no, I'm a big fan of Carl's work and we've been following along uh, and the work that he's doing. It's something I think what we're seeing a lot in sort of the retro PGF and optimism space is we're trying to, everyone's trying to define what impact actually means, of course, right? You have... You have the open source community talking about the, the developer impact sort of at, at the base layer level. And you also then have applications talking about it, sort of the on-chain impact level of sequencer fees, uh, since that is the actual funding mechanism that's something like Optimism is using. Um, so we've kind of been looking at it as, hey, let's create this very neutral primitive that anyone can use, uh, including ourselves, uh, and then figure out what actual impact actually means and use this as a mechanism to actually achieve that impact in terms of how we actually allocate capital correctly. So, um, yeah, it, it's been interesting. It's a nice little plug for uh, grant programs as well, because we've been able to work with all these different grant programs and as boost as a mechanism to help pro projects also distribute uh, their grant money as well. Yeah. Well, I'd love to hear what you think the most interesting apps built on top of boost are uh maybe and, and i'd say maybe even assume that the audience doesn't really know what rabbit hole is I, i'd love to hear about the application layer and and what kind of use cases people are using it for yeah for sure so use cases are for basically any action that can be incentivized on chain right so you have of course l2s that want to generate activity in the network we're putting tokens behind this you have DEXs that want to, want to achieve growth. Right? I think growth is like a, the giant category right now that has most of the volume. But then you kind of have all this like long tail use cases of well boost, right? You have NFT creators like Cooper Turley and Coop Records using it to actually boost uh, music mints on sound. 
you have people on Zora using it to boost NFT mints on, on, on Zora. Then you also have delegates in, in governance actually using Boost to incentivize delegation to actually get more delegate votes, right? So you're, we're kind of seeing this whole spectrum of different use cases because it can literally be applied to any on-chain action where right? you can incentivize. Um, and so we're just trying to be this sort of neutral layer where anyone can plug in a very modular way. You can add your smart contract to the protocol just through a plug-in. Um, so we kind of just make sure we provide that foundational infrastructure and try to be as neutral as possible. Nice. One thing that's interesting here is that you're adding economic incentives to a whole category of actions that can be on chain. Really, anything can be on chain. Um, how, how are you finding? How does discovery work? You know, say I'm someone in the ecosystem that wants to discover yeah. by opportunities to earn a boost. Uh, how, how, how does that work? Because attention is the other scarce resource here. In yeah, addition exactly. To capital. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So that's the, that's the other side of the marketplace you were talking about. So that is where uh, interface like rabbit hole comes into play, where you can actually discover earning opportunities that are targeted to you based off your, your on-chain reputation. And, and something that we're seeing a lot in the space is that um, these, these issuers who are issuing these boosts are actually looking at the on-chain data, data graph of if maybe you're, you're uh, verified because of Gitcoin Passport, maybe you're verified because you're, you've done a bunch of things on Farcast or follow certain channels, then you're being targeted with opportunities based upon this, this on-chain graph. Um, and then you can see which opportunities you're available for on Rabbit Hole, on Boost Inblock, which is a new client we just launched. Uh, and other wallets who are also integrating Boost, like, like Zerion and some others that have Daylight as sort of integration partner. Um, so it, it's cool. That there's like a variety of interfaces that you can actually discover and, and complete these things. It's not kind of on a single interface itself and that those interfaces get a cut of rewards for kind of facilitating the completion of those. Yeah. As you were saying that, it sort of made me realize that this is sort of opening up a whole new on-chain business model for wallets and and dApps that are able to get their users to go in and complete a boost. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, this is definitely a way to re-engage your audience for, for wallets uh, at, at the same time. So it's we've some, had some exciting conversations there and some people trying it out so far. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm on your website, boost.xyz, which we'll have in the show notes, and just want to call out that uh, this is not merely theoretical. You've had about uh, a little over $3 million in USD distributed to 267,000 unique users. So you're putting up some numbers, and this is as of March 13th, Blob Day, uh, 2024, <laughs> uh, and that's that'll right. continue growing. But uh, yeah, that's that's a that's a decent amount of volume so far. Where you think most of the growth will come for come from in the twenty twenty four market? What uh, what areas are you looking to see people add boosts to? Yeah, it, it, it's going to probably be the same thing that it's been so far, which is uh, L two is kind of across the board. L twos are all fighting for block space, trying to fight for users, especially now with with blobs entering the scene. Now we're just going to see fees even even drop even more so there'll just be more opportunities to sponsor and promote transactions which we see with most of the opportunity coming from so it's going to be interesting as as 444 kind of levels the playing field we'll probably see this world where, where a lot of crypto is abstracted away and people are now doing things for free which kind of opens up a kindly new market to now sponsor transactions where users are actually getting paid on every single transaction they do instead because it's so cheap to complete transactions um, and so we see the yeah. opportunity for Boost as this really this cash back model for users where now L2s or any token issuer can actually just start sponsoring transactions to kind of bring them to certain uh, block space as well. So that's kind of the main thing that we're thinking about for 2024 and, and, and uh, the kind of new paradigm of blobs. Yeah. Um, I feel like having really cheap transactions, transactions that are as cheap as air, is just going to open up this whole new design space. Totally. I know that you said it. I'm just repeating it so that the audience internalizes it. But um, you know, my main business, you know, like Gitcoin, we were one of the first first apps, I think, to to integrate an L2 in summer of 2020, and yeah. I just remember being so passionate about that because the whole point of quadratic funding is is giving the little guy or little girl the opportunity to allocate capital in these ecosystems and the median transaction for a time was only a dollar and you can't give a dollar transaction when there's a $20 fee. I think there's going to be this whole design space of applications with transactions that are as cheap as air or even paid for by the, the D app. Maybe the, the D app earns boosts and that's how it, it, it subsidizes the gas rewards that 
that wasn't even possible before. And, uh, you know, I know that you've sort of teased it a little bit, but anything else to say about that design space once transactions trend fees trend towards zero? What kind of weird stuff are we going to see? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure yet. I mean, it, it's interesting. There, there, you could see some, if you look at the Solana ecosystem, I think you could see some future of what Ethereum L2s may look yeah. like because they've already entered that fee paradigm and, and they're doing things like, hey, everyone's just getting free NFTs left and right. And everyone's just like, you know, it's kind of like Venice Boardwalk style. Everyone's kind of just handing out free things left and right. I think I think we'll probably get to this get to the state of, of crypto where you just get a wallet and everyone's just starting to send you free tokens, free NFTs, and like all the spam that you've probably seen in wallets over the past two years kind of just gets like ten or hundred x a little crazier. Um, and then you just see your balance like starting to go up, kind of just like randomly, very volatile, and you never really have to like on ramp. To crypto in that case as a new user you just kind of just like get a wallet and just like start earning because everyone's just sending you free stuff that may or may not have value um so i think that's like mm-hmm. the weird stuff that like may may emerge uh, out of this um it, you kind of the, the, the freeness of things becomes a lot more accessible um so so yeah it, it'll be interesting to see uh, kind of kind of what comes of it uh, but not really sure yet of, of the types of applications i think we'll have to still wait and see what comes about i think the last year in, in general has been very unpredictable for crypto probably more unpredictable in the future as well yeah it's it's hard to reason about with any amount of foresight but i think in hindsight it'll it'll be you know like completely obvious it's like asking people to predict social networking in the 1990s before you know, we'd like really permeated the internet into our brains. Um, but I'm excited for it. And, and in some ways, the Solana analogy is a good one because they've had like really cheap fees before anyone else, but it's also a much more, less mature ecosystem than the ETH yeah. ecosystem. And so, you know, it seems like they're just like kind of in some ways repeating DeFi summer, but on Solana. Um, right. But I don't know. Yeah. Knowing where to look for inspiration, I think is, is one of the, is one of like the questions to reason about as as you're exploring this design space and so we'll keep an eye on all the different l choose and um yeah i'll be curious to see where it goes yeah anything else to say about like the fee list design space or just cheap transactions or just what you see at the frontier of l choose yeah I, I think now what we're, we're starting to see with a bunch of l twos is the uh, the token distribution uh of issuance design space is kind of changing very rapidly. Like Retro PGF is obviously one, one mechanism pe- people are using. Uh, Arbitrum mm-hmm. DAO obviously is this very bottoms up type structure that we're also seeing kind of this new design space going. A blast is kind of one side of the extreme of the L2s that is being very aggressive with, with point structures as well. So I think everyone's sort of figuring out how to get faster and faster token distribution issuance, essentially, to the point where things are just becoming more hyper-financialized over a period of time, per se, to the point where everyone is sort of battling this incentives war right now on the L2 front. So, like, no matter where you go, you sort of just see a whole bunch of incentives just being piled on, and projects are trying to get their incentive war chest just to compete with other ones on, on other L2 ecosystems as well. And so yeah. um, I, I think that will only only increase with, with 4844 um, as well. So just it, it'll, be, it'll be interesting how, how – I, I literally think there's going to be a world in which every transaction you do as a user, you will get paid in, in some capacity and, and you won't have to – even worry about the fees to some extent, just because of how much incentives are going to be thrown at you to transact there, um, which is which is really no yeah. different than like than like credit card rewards in some cases, right? Like credit card rewards, like you are, like you're always earning rewards. You go to coffee shop and everyone's like, please like sign up for my loyalty rewards program, uh, and, and they kind of like throw it in your face. So I think it's I think it's going to be more extreme in the on chain world. Yeah, for sure. It feels like there's two ways to reason about this. Um, the 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 first for me is like I want to live in a world in which people are earning on chain and their first experience with blockchains is earning money for having an impact in their in their community or earning money in some way and and actually tangibly being able to pay rent or put food on the table for their kids instead of just like you know your first experience is buying an NFT or something like that um, and then the other way to reason about this is that there's a war for attention and talent right now and I think that that's expressed in this. Uh, 
the the points meta, uh, which was pioneered by FriendTech. Basically, you do actions on FriendTech and you get points. And everyone's speculating that those points would turn into tokens in a future airdrop. And competing with each other for user attention by issuing these points. And the the OODA loop, the observe orient decide act like the the loop of assigning points measuring actions and assigning points can be much faster now and i'm actually looking at your your twitter and you guys have an on-chain point stack so it feels like you guys are kind of like arming the uh the people who are issuing points with better ways of measuring precisely what's going on in their ecosystem and i kind of see these two things uh connecting people earning on chain by by doing actions and the evolving meta of points and we're going to meet in the middle and create this world where people are going to earn on chain as their first experience as opposed to buying buying an asset so that gets quite exciting and and hope to see it this cycle yeah, definitely. The, the, the points meta in general, you know, started to evolve when, when people were, were like, projects wanted a way to experiment with incentives without actually having a token um, and kind of create that sort of uh, grayness between users. Um, I, I think kind of our approach to this has been, hey, let's give that transparency to users. Let's give them how much they're actually earning of kind of a one-to-one basis. Um, and, but it's, it's not habit liquid per se. So it's not this hyper financialized thing that kind of represents ownership. And then once they hit a certain KPI or metric inside of the network or the protocol, actually turn on transferability later so that it's kind of met one to one. So it's kind of an experiment to see how can we actually reward ownership to the right participants in the network before sort of the transferability or kind of the, the mercenariness of, of tokens kind of kicks in and kind of takes over an overdrive. So um, I think there's still lots of experimentation to be done with sort of the uh, on-chain points per se. So excited to uh, keep trying it out. Yeah. Well, um, you said the word mercenary and um, I guess I'm, I'm wondering like, is there is there a meta that's evolved for attracting more missionary people to your ecosystem versus mercenary? Is that something people actually care about? Yeah. Uh, it, it, you know, what does that design space look like in your head? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. You know, I, I think crypto, I mean, you know this well, I think crypto back in 2017, 2018, like was super, super missionary, obviously. And then over time has like become way, 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 way more mercenary. Yeah. I think, you well, know, I, you I, think, don't know. I feel like, I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't mean to interrupt you, but uh, I, I just feel like it's impossible to paint the 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 space with a broad stroke. Like, I don't think ICO participants fair, in 2017 were missionary, that's but fair. like, there's definitely a certain subset of people who are yeah. around for for the values, but. Uh, yeah. But, but yeah, anyway, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, I guess I'm wondering, uh, you know, what you think the like the meta is for attracting missionaries to your ecosystem, and yeah. and how you design for that. I think one of the best ways to do this is uh, start really wide, just try and get participants uh, actually to the ecosystem. That is going to have to be with some some mercenary tokens, like some, like an airdrop or people just earning by doing things in sort of very low contribution style. And then just naturally seeing who steps up and who starts participating without sort of the incentive, who actually stays for the values, for the culture, or actually whoever believes in the mission of what the network or the DAO or the protocol is actually trying to achieve, right? And then actually rewarding those participants in a very smaller and smaller and smaller funnel. Um, so th- it's something very similar to, again, to like the loyalty space, right, where you're actually you kind of give loyalty rewards as an acquisition cost. And then you're kind of seeing who retains over a period of time and making sure that people are retaining in the network and they become ambassadors, right? It's a kind of a very similar model to some extent. So I think we can learn a lot from sort of loyalty and rewards for kind of where airdrops and token distributions actually evolving in the future. Um, I think there is sort of this very uh, gray area right now between sort of how you reward ownership and give some certain granular permissions over certain smart contracts and, and extra tokens in the network. But again, it's just a very wide design space right now that a lot of people are trying to figure out and trying to figure out just where airdrops in general are headed next. Because I think that that is the mechanism that people are kind of looking after in terms of actually finding those person, sorry, finding those missionaries and having them continuously participate in the network afterwards. Yeah. And I feel like the, you know, the other ultimate opportunity here is not just finding the missionaries, but cultivating them. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how many people start in these ecosystems as a mercenary and become a missionary. 
um, and, and what the design space looks like there. And I think given enough data, boost in rabbit hole may actually be in an opportunity to, to sort of measure that and figure out how to catch that lightning in a bottle. Yeah, totally. And I think this is something that some protocols have, have been interested in is just figuring out how to test different incentive mechanisms over a period of time before committing to more programmatic or fixed incentive distribution schedule. Like how, how can you actually test, say, I, I would reward users on a, on a daily or weekly basis and find those users who are contributing very continuous capacity um, instead of saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to just reward 100 tokens per day for the next four years, which protocols commonly do. Um, so it, it's been interesting seeing how protocols are starting to change their tune on this um, in the new meta. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm wondering, um, Green Pill Season 4 is all about capital allocation. The high-level hypothesis is that um, on-chain capital allocation is going to look way different than pre-on-chain capital allocation. We're going to be able to do more scalable, precise capital allocation without intermediaries. And that's going to open up a whole new design space of ways that communities fund what matters to them and how people earn a living in the 21st century. And, and I'm wondering if you have any reaction to that hypothesis or areas that you think are interesting to explore it within that that sort of idea that on-chain capital allocation is going to be an important design space. Where does your mind go when 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 I rattle that off? Yeah, no, totally. I, I think you're already starting to see uh, lots of DAOs and protocols really experiment with, with capital allocation in an efficient way just to kind of fund different public goods. I just look at Nouns, for example, as like one of the, the biggest DAOs in the Ethereum space. They, you know, they funded that beautiful uh, 4844 video this week as well that kind of just brought the space together in, in, you know, in some cases. Um, but I, I think what you're also starting to see from like a mechanism standpoint is, is capital allocation being hooked into different smart contracts to give much more granular permissions over, over certain things and on chain. I think streaming protocols like Superfluid making it very easy to vest as long as certain metrics are being hit are in the hedgy as well. Um, and be able to do different clawbacks all on chain. Uh, so I, I think that the whole being able to take grants and now figure out how to actually do much more interesting mechanisms it is kind of the next goal with, with grant and capital allocation. So we're starting to already see interesting things in different DAOs and protocols and probably will continue to see that um, even as, as fees and in, in come down with 4844, which obviously is going to just be a big theme of Blob Day. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we, if I could pinch and zoom on what you said, which is, you know, there's interesting things happening in these L2s. What are the most weird and interesting and frontier things that you've seen? Uh, or, or I guess, what are the most exciting things that you've seen? I think I think sequencer fee sharing back into the DAO is is this is a category that everyone's sort of exploring mm. in some way or another, right? So um, I think you're seeing it from from optimism in which you know sequency fee sharing is going back to refund uh, the retro PGF. I think the Arbitrum is using it to to defund the DAO. I think you know you're having uh, other super chain. Uh, L2s like like Mode uh, using it to reward users and projects building on top of it or field growth. Um, so, so that is the kind of the core mechanism that, that I think a lot of L2s are starting to realize that actually brings more growth into the ecosystem. So really interested to see how that pairs with capital allocation of actually being able to give projects and users who are actually bringing more growth to the network to reinvest the capital back into the ecosystem to even grow it even more and refuel it. Um, so interested to see how that goes. You know, it's been something everyone's been talking about over the past few years, but something I think is a powerful mechanism uh, that can bring a lot of good to the space. Yeah, it feels like w one sort of thing that I'm, I'm I, I, I think is like a general good rule of thumb is like look for the areas that are economically exothermic. Um, so so basically, like in in the ocean around ocean vents around where magma and and thermal heat. Comes, there's actually a lot of life that comes in and lives off of the energy that comes out of the ocean vents, right? And um, the word economically exothermic means like what is what is exuding uh, money? What is what is exuding like the economic equivalent of heat, which is which is which is like tokens and, and money, and and so sequencer fees l2s have a, a source of economically in, exothermic tokens in which those are going to be distributed to an ecosystem uh that's being built around that 
And, um, you know, I think LRT, that's why there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of excitement around restaking protocols right now, because there's going to be native yield coming out of that. And I'm really excited to see, instead of people just gathering around these giant treasuries of valueless governance tokens, actually seeing yield being a, yeah. a thing that people gather around, because that feels like it's much more sustainable than, than treasuries, totally. which can fluctuate up and down, you know, Governance tokens have their places, but um, yeah, I don't know. That maybe just the rule, the rule of thumb I'm 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 landing on here is like wherever there's economically exothermic sources of yield happening, that's where interesting capital allocation is going to happen, and you can build these positive sum games where the community helps create more yield by gathering around the yield through kickbacks and and boost incentives and stuff like that. So I don't know. Any reaction to that? You no, know, that, that, that's totally right. Uh, I, I think one problem with, with, with what you're saying that we've seen as well is when you start off with this like giant pool of governance tokens and you're trying to be like, okay, well, let's figure out how to allocate this. There's just so much money in this treasury sometimes that like you, there was no work to actually get there in the first place. You know, it's sort of there's reasons why they're there, but they kind of magically appeared there, and it's like there was no sort of work put in to figure out what is the best way to allocate these. But now that you get this native yield sources, and you're actually working off the native yield sources that are kind of starting from from almost zero in some cases, now you're being much more frugal, much more trying to figure out much more capital efficient of how to actually distribute those as well. So. Um, I, I totally agree with everything you're saying that now we're just trying to figure out how to, how to put this money in and start putting it to work and then taking that money that's being put to work and reinvest it into the ecosystem as well to kind of grow it even further. Um, so ex- excited to see how that meta evolves as well. Yeah, it, it feels like crypto has gotten really good at capital formation, gathering funds into a central <laughs> country. And if you think yeah. about the like, there's almost like a, a yang to that yin, which is how do you distribute it once it's actually out there? And so far, all we've come up with is just governance proposals that take everyone's time and attention and they're overly political. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really excited to see the the draw the rest of the owl on top of forming capital, which is allocating it to your community. And if we can find trustless and effective ways of doing it, then it gets really interesting. And especially if there's a plurality of capital allocation, uh, in, you know, I think this is actually the three, three between Gitcoin and rabbit hole is that um, direct to contract incentives are totally complementary to Gitcoin grants and the retroactive yeah. public goods funding that we're doing. And if we get totally. to a world where there's a plurality of capital allocation mechanisms, there's way less upside to game any, any one of them. Um, you know, like we, we talk a lot about client diversity in Ethereum and not having any client having more than 33% of the network share. What does it look like when these DAOs are allocating capital through a plurality of mechanisms and none of them have more than 25% of the Apple capital allocation mechanisms? Uh, that, that seems like really scalable to me because people can't game it. And also each mechanism has to do one thing and do it well, but it's, it's together in an ecology of capital allocation that they start to really create active, healthy, vibrant communities of both mercenaries and missionaries. So, um, yeah, I don't know. TLDR 3.3 between Gitcoin and Rabbit Hole, for sure. Yeah, totally. Yeah, you you know, we're personally very interested in the idea of how do different mechanisms work together? How are they mutually incentivized? You know, I think, I know you've done some thinking on this and have done some exploration on what, like, alliance between two protocols actually looks like in some cases. Um, there's been people who've tried it over the years, but it seems like we're, we're getting to the point now with, with capital allocation where now it's actually possible for it to happen. Uh, maybe it's something like shared sequencers that will actually make that feasible. Who knows? It's kind of like too early to say. Um, but but I'm really interested to, to kind of figure out what, how do mechanisms work together. I think it's exactly what you're saying is focusing on, on one specific thing in, in the stack and being really good at it and figuring out how it fits with other pieces in that modular puzzle. Um, I think it's very different than, than how protocols operated in the past, which is kind of just tries to do everything, be very horizontal, and then eventually become its own chain. Now we're trying to get very specific pieces uh, in the puzzle as well. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting to see the evolving meta here. If you were to project all this out 10 years, what kind of weird things do you think? Oh, we'll 10 see? years. And maybe an, a, another way of asking this is like, if Boost <laughs> is mass, maximally successful, what do things look like in 10 years? I like to I like to think of it as sort of this matchmaking protocol, right? So just like how you know any play of MMOs, you have this like LFG, right? You say, hey, I'm looking for a group, uh, and and I want to find it's exactly what Boost will be, right? So you basically say, hey, I have all this digital reputation because I've done these things on chain. I have these assets. 
you're being awarded with a earning opportunity from a protocol that has chose you because you're the best person to accomplish or best address, best bot, whatever it is to actually accomplish that task, right? So it's just essentially matchmaking between protocols that are looking to distribute ownership and tokens and users and, and bots that are actually looking to complete work uh, in some cases uh, in an on-chain action uh, capacity. Uh, so that, that's kind of how we think about that evolution over time. Yeah, it's interesting for you to call it a matching protocol or a matching engine. I don't know if listeners know this, but my first CTO gig in Web2 was running a dating site. And so I've thought a lot about yeah. like, how do how do you how do you match people with other people? How do you match supply and demand? And there's there's a lot of like weird fun stuff you can do once you hit a certain scale where you've got inventory on on both sides. It feels weird to talk about people and community as inventory, but in this context of a marketplace, uh, that's kind of what they are to the matching engine. And um, man, I think you can really help realize that vision of people earning crypto as as their first. Uh, as their first experience with crypto. And, and that would be cool. Like when people are telling their legislators, I'm earning from crypto uh, and, and that's what people are hearing. It's going to create a lot of more pro crypto, pro peer to peer money, uh, politician uh, and, and pro social behavior out there. So that's exciting. Yeah, no, no, totally. I think there's still a long way to go before we get there, but uh, making strides uh, hopefully uh, to get there. Yeah, for sure. I'm excited to to see this ecosystem built of capital allocation. I'm excited to see where Boost goes. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you want to say? Uh, no, I think that, that covered it. I, um, we just launched a new uh, client for Boost called Boost Inbox. Um, so definitely check it out. It's kind of the evolution of Rebel cases, just me trying to make it a little bit more abstracted, take advantage of sort of this cross-chain UX type paradigm that we have um, in crypto. Um, we're really trying to make that as, as simple as possible for, for new users coming into crypto. So definitely recommend checking that out. Um, other than that, just really interested in, in uh, where blobs go, honestly. I think that's the big thing that's top of mind for me. Yeah, it just feels like we've just opened up. We've just gone over this horizon of really cheap transactions on L2s. And I think there's going to be a lot of fun innovation that happens there. So, um, yeah, excited to see where that goes. Uh, and, and I'll also call out before we end the episode and, and just say that I'm really excited to figure out what the 3.3 is between Allo <laughs> Protocol and Boost Protocol. Yeah. feels like we could maybe issue an RFP to have people explore that design space of, of how do we do Allo on Boost and Boost on Allo. And uh, mm -hmm. there definitely feels like a 3.3 there because they're complementary and playing in, in similar spaces. So. Uh, just wanted to to say that out loud uh, before we record the or in the episode. And if listeners have any ideas of how to combine Allo Capital Allocation Protocol and in Boost Protocol, please reach out to me on on Twitter, and uh, maybe we can throw up an RFP or something and have have yeah. someone build an MVP. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Anything else to say before we close? Uh, nope. That's it. Thanks for having me on the podcast. It was a blast. Yeah, for sure. I think we've been friends for years, so it's finally uh, it's good to mint it as a podcast episode. Yeah. Well, uh, Brian, uh, you are an innovator in the space. It's been great to talk to you. For the listener, please check out Brian's Twitter profile at FlynnJam and Boost is at Boost.xyz. We'll have links in the show notes where you can check both of those out. Uh, peace and love. See you next time. Cool. Thanks, Kevin. Bye. You just heard from Brian Flynn. I'm excited about Boost.xyz because I think it's an example of capital allocation at scale. Boost is a very simple primitive on some level, but it's also very powerful because of the amount of expressibility that it it, it gives you in allocating capital precisely at scale and without intermediaries. An example of capital allocation in an on-chain world. Thanks for listening to the GreenPill.network podcast. Again, we are building a coordination, a network society of thousands of hackers, dreamers, and doers focused on using crypto to bring positive some digital systems to the world like Brian Flynn, like Rabbit Hole, and like Boost.xyz. If you value our work, you can collect this episode. Go to pods.media slash GreenPill to find this episode and start collecting. While you're here, please remember to subscribe, rate, and review. It helps us build the regenerative crypto economic movement. Peace and love. I will see you next time.